We are very pleased to have Amanda Williams with us today. Um, I'm very excited to hear her point of view and perspective uh, for us today. Um, uh, she's a visual artist who trained as an architect. Raised in Chicago's Auburn Gresham neighborhood, she is best known for her series Colored Theory, exhibited at Chicago's inaugural architectural biennial, in which she painted the exterior of soon to be demolished houses using culturally charged color palettes. Um, we possibly will hear about that today. Uh, Amanda is a highly sought after lecturer and the subject of many articles on the relationship between art, race, and urbanism. She is in collaboration with Andres Hernandez, is the recipient of the Pulitzer Art Foundation 2017 PXSTL, a public art commission, and has forthcoming exhibitions at the Arts Clubs of Chicago and the Museum of Contemporary Art this summer. Uh, so a lot of exciting things happening for Amanda, and please keep your eyes out for that. Um, she has served as uh, an adjunct professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology and a visiting assistant professor at Washington University Sam Fox School of Art and Design. Uh, she lives in Bronzeville, and we are very excited to have her. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to College of DuPage. I, as Mara mentioned, I uh, teach at IIT, and some of our best architecture students come from here. So it's great to be here to see where, it all, where the magic happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what color is possibility? So um, color is a passion of mine, and so I like to title each lecture with something um, that suggests a mood that's either going on locally or, or maybe where we might want to be as a country or a world. So today it's what color is possibility. Um, and so I'll give you guys a little bit of my background and kind of the things that I'm preoccupied with that have led to some of the projects. <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll quickly go through um, color theory and a few of the other projects that I've been working on um, and then leave time for questions from you guys. So I am from the south side of Chicago and um, grew up on one side of town and went to school in another part of town. And so a lot of the um, that traversing back and forth formed my kind of understanding of um, ideas about composition and color and beauty. Um, all the things you guys are learning in, in 2D. Um, but also this kind of very interesting way in which architecture in particular um, was, was read as kind of fragments or always this idea of collage or um, layered understandings of space. And so um, text also was a, a huge part of it in the kind of purposeful misreading of text to kind of find messages or to think about ways to um, create messages for people. So, even though this doesn't say this, there's a way in which it could read, in the city, Chicago is black beauty. So a lot of times I'll, I'll um, continue to even use this method to this day of kind of um, collaging components together to either have better understandings about what I'm thinking about in relationship to composition or um, if it's 3D with space or even 2D, uh, the implication of space. So this is a drawing from my architectural thesis, which I was just told was 20 years ago. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I grew up on the South Side, and then I studied architecture at Cornell University, and it was a fantastic experience, but it was completely foreign to the environment I had grown up in and what my expectations were about what architecture was supposed to do and what I was supposed to um, use architecture for. And so this collage was part of a series where I was really, at that moment, trying to grapple with the idea that I'd learned architecture with a capital A, but I felt like I lived in, in a place where architecture was a lowercase a. And so both searching for the visual representation to describe that, but also kind of working through what it meant to have this degree and what it was going to mean to operate, um, presumably in the city that I loved, with this, with this title or through this lens. Um, so I did what any great architect would do, and I ran to San Francisco and practice for seven years, but um, in the interim, continue to think about the things that had driven me to want to study architecture and become an architect, and then um, the realities of what I learned in kind of contrast to that. Um, and so it was a number of years in kind of um, a circuitous path to really thinking about ways in which I could explore this subject um, at the same time that I was working and being a young adult in a city that I'd never lived in and all kinds of other exciting things going on. But um, 
going back to starting to think about the idea of the diagram or kind of fundamental architectural spaces, um, something like the corner as a type or a space, and then how that can be read and misread in multiple ways. Um, so this is just a close-up of a sign that had, that's corroded on the side of a building. Um, but then this, this double reading all the time. So in structures class, learning about a three-stud corner and then going home and thinking of a four-stud corner, right? So like, what does it mean to have that literacy? And anybody that comes from two worlds knows what I'm talking about, whether that's religion or culture or language, um, if, you, if you're bilingual or trilingual or, or have to translate constantly for yourself or for others, this is a happenstance, but we don't always leverage that ability. Um, and often, depending on the social stigma, we try to downplay one or the other. But if these things have equal weight, what is the potential of the type of work that we can make? I'm also a child of the hip-hop generation, so Common is a little bit older than me by like a year or two. But also um, thinking about the infusion of other art forms. At this time, it was architecture, but thinking about contemporary art and then also thinking about music, literature, other things that are also describing um, space and form in the city and the ways in which we could, um, again, leverage that or use it to our advantage. And so uh, several, several years later, this is all very compressed, but coming up with this prompt for myself as a way to kind of um, guide me through the work that, that I wanted to be making, um, particularly translating some of my understanding of architecture into uh, visual art in particular, um, painting. So painting is, I think, my, my happy place. And then color within painting, I think, is the thing that, that sort of sticks with me. And so what color is space and race? And that seemed like an appropriate kind of moment to land on where it's, a, it's an impossible question to answer in a single way. And it actually requires a, a kind of um, visual lyricism in order to even get at it. And so this idea that my brain at any given moment is operating kind of two worlds. So on the one hand, a Daniel Burnham and his, um, his mantra for all of us to make no little plans for the city of Chicago and that really being the driving force between a lot of the way um, planning and, and kind of uh, urbanism evolved for the city. And then again, Common really saying and talking about the same things um, with his song, The Corner but a, a lot of his music, just very um, illustrative of the, of the South Side and of the, the Chicago that I'd grown up in, and then also really pushing to go beyond that and to really leverage that and to use it to, um, to think big. And so then I started applying this idea of what color is to spaces or things that actually don't have a color, but that, that imply either racially or culturally something else. And so it becomes this really powerful way to force your brain to kind of think in multiple modes about um, trying to solve this, this kind of riddle. Um, and then a lot of the, a lot of the training I had um, in architecture and then also a lot of the, the work that I was doing at IIT related to um, obviously the, the kind of foundational bedrock of modernism and really thinking about the way color was infused or not infused or implied um, in the theory and the text that we were sort of presenting as ways to understand. And so again, what happens when you start to juxtapose some of these, um, these texts with some of these images that are not necessarily what is being discussed or talked about or decontextualizing um, ways that we describe space as if it's objective when in fact it's, it's actually pretty subjective. And so thinking about how we approach our understanding of either these environments or of theory itself when we kind of smash them together. And so all of that was a kind of build up to this aha moment for me that I um, called Colored Theory as a series, where I really went back to the roots of my kind of understanding of color and the passion for color, and then thought about what it would mean if I inserted myself into this lineage. So um, Albers in particular is, um, is one of my favorites, not only for this um, kind of understanding of color as relational or being the pioneer of understanding color always in the context of something else. So double readings consistently, but also for this, this kind of practice that became this lifetime of study in addition to production. And in particular, his um, series of homage to the square, which is over and over and over again at every scale in all sorts of uh, ways that he was constantly um, happily, hopefully, struggling with this, and then developing a whole, um, a whole set of understanding systems, writings, um, teaching tools to kind of 
share that knowledge and that ongoing understanding um, with his students and, and his um, counterparts. And his wife was also um, an amazing, in her own right, color theorist and used textiles um, and elevating ideas about craft as well. But I just love that, that you know, in many, almost all of the images that you can find of the refined paintings, you can find just as many with the notes and that it was like a constant study even with someone who had kind of mastered this and the idea that, that the, the study never stops. And then Le Corbusier, who was a um, Swiss architect, spent much of his time in France, but also was a painter and really tried to advance his own, um, his own theories and movements around um, painting and architecture, but also um, developed this system called polychromy in which he um, worked with the Salubra Paint Company to come up with this kind of systematized way in which um, you could order paint, but then also uh, this key card that would help you kind of put colors together, primarily for interior purposes, but could kind of um, elevate the role of color and design even for the layperson. So uh, he kind of pioneered the first round of this in the, in the late 30s, I think, and then did another round sometime in the 50s. But I was telling the class earlier today, it also was a moment where there was no Pantone, there was no, there were not systems where you could guarantee that, you know, pink 4320C was gonna be the exact pink that you could get six months from now from that same company. So really trying to, um, not only systematize, but, it, but in this industrial moment, really trying to streamline the ability to have this kind of consistency. And then I started to also think about what it would mean to insert myself and what I would have looked like in the moment in which I was existing in this idea of color and colored theory and the, the significant impact race has had um, on my existence. And so Josephine Baker, who became um, an acquaintance of Corbusier's and was the kind of muse for Adolf Luce, another architect who actually made a house kind of in homage to her, was actually a French spy. Um, and so I also was really interested in this idea of um, leveraging the fact that people underestimate or misread us as people and our potential and what can happen. And that while I like to pretend to have these conversations with these guys, in the actuality, I would not have necessarily been um, part of their discourse. And so I like to think about the relationship that color could have to uh, material or a piece of architecture or even an art movement's afterlife or reincarnation. And so thinking about um, this insertion or ways to think around this issue, on the left is a house in Inglewood and it would become one of the subjects of colored theory. And on the right is Le Cabousier's Villa Savoy in Poissy, which is right outside of Paris, France, in a format that we don't typically see the building in. And so this idea that magically great architecture is perfect and sustained is a falsehood that we sort of know, but we don't, we don't really accept. And conversely, the idea that certain parts of a city or certain parts of a neighborhood are worthy of uh, devaluation, disinvestment, neglect, is also a falsehood, right? That, that maintenance plays a huge role in what great architecture or art or societies are about. And so I like to show this image in, in proximity to the Vitruvius quote, right, about what a, what a well-building needs to have and to really think about how we accept and or form these narratives for ourselves. And so what are other ways that we have the ability to transform those narratives, either to hold on to or to dispel or to invest equally? And so color theory was really born from me initially trying to find this unique south side color palette, thinking originally of architectural materials, and then moving really quickly into an idea about the way color has shaped my sensibility of space, particularly public or um, not domestic, space on the south side. And so very quickly it went to products or to systems that were actually not architectural in nature. Um, so I was raised in the 70s and the 80s, and so a lot of these products were things that were ubiquitous in the, um, the kind of parts of the city that I operated in or in the social spaces that I operated in. And so it became the kind of foundation for me starting to put together this palette that would be a system that really just simply talked about a very particular moment. I started with currency exchange because that was the only piece of architecture I could think of that had a color associated more strongly with the building than the form of the building itself, right? In the era of a, a city where you've got Wright and Sullivan and Meese and all these giants um, 
what were these what were these architectural moments that I could point to? And so that fell apart very quickly, and it, and it really did come down to the things that had been marketed in these commercial spaces as opposed to the, the forms and the buildings themselves. So this was an early palette that got refined down to a set of eight colors um, that I sat on for quite a while, and then really started to infuse back into the architecture itself and to think about ways in which this color system could help drive a different reading of these environments. And so from that, color theory was born. And it was eight houses that had been vacated and slated for demolition. So as part of the process, it was also really important for me that I didn't get permission from anybody. I had become an architect to kind of change the landscape that I'd grown up in. And so I'd been a mentor and career days and murals and community cleanups and you know, you name it, I've done it relationship to um, trying to help improve and develop community. And so it was important to me in this moment to actually not ask anyone's permission, not the city, not the neighbors, not anybody, and to kind of see a way in which um, art or um, art that has an architectural focus could actually begin to be the thing that transforms a neighborhood or an area. And so these houses were part of a public registry that the city would have, and then I cross-referenced those with tax delinquencies, and then also just do kind of recon driving through the neighborhoods to see because it was really important to me that nobody valued these pieces of architecture. So it wasn't a hangout spot, it wasn't the drug spot, it wasn't the um, homeless guy sleeping there, it wasn't something that a developer or uh, a realtor could come and fix up. These were things that were kind of at the end of their architectural life cycle. Somebody described this as hospice, which I thought was really beautiful, um, as a question for why, why, would you, why would you sort of clean up and paint these things that you know are going to go away. So that's my um, husband on the left. He is not an artist. He's not particularly fond of artists, except me. No, I, he, he cringe if you hear me saying that. No, but he's, he's, not, um, he's not particularly interested, but he is interested in big ideas and big goals. And so he didn't quite understand what I was talking about and obsessing about. And then when he got it, he was sort of on it. And as you can see, this is him here. Now he's like leading the whole charge here. There's me. He's like, higher, to the left, turn it sideways. He's an athlete, so he's all about like maximum performance and getting every piece of it. And so he actually did most of the painting after the, this was the very first house we did. This is a 100 degree day in June or July. Uh, he mowed the grass and cut down all the bushes. I always joke so that he didn't have to talk to my art friends. He had something else to do. But, uh, but he really got into it. Um, and at the very end of this first house, he said, we got to keep doing these until you get arrested. <laughs> so that was, the, that was the mantra for continuing the series. Uh, but instead of getting arrested, I got all of this major attention that I didn't anticipate. So about four of the eight houses in, um, they were announcing the inaugural architecture biennial. And um, Sarah Hurd and Joseph Grimmer, who were the curators, were just amazing at really convincing me that just presenting the houses in a very simple format would be immensely powerful and would be um, a really great addition to a conversation about the future of architecture and architecture uh, related to Chicago in general, and that the subject was, was worthy of um, that kind of context. And so the orange on the walls is actually the eighth house, so the seven were presented, and then the eighth was painted in relationship to that. But in addition to that, I somehow became a future leader of global architecture. Uh, and so it was really interesting to think about this, this kind of meandering path I'd taken to really trying to find my best self and how all of a sudden I became an expert. Like, so, you know, it takes 20 years to become this overnight sensation, right? Um, and really being able to offer this unique perspective and voice about subjects specifically related to architecture, but also the role of art. Um, what does socially engaged art mean? Am I, am I a social change agent? All of these, these really interesting questions that I initially actually resisted. Um, and I think that was, that was and continues to be really helpful to the dialogue itself, that there's not a single answer or there's not a way to, to uh, make a formula to achieve these things. So this is the final house. This is the Flame and Red Hots house. So we painted it on an opening weekend of the biennial. And so we'd gone from those first pictures where there were like five or six of us to 70 people, so we bought very little brushes. Because we could usually knock these houses out in about three hours. We'd go early on Sunday mornings before anybody was awake or when everybody who might do bad things was asleep. We'd paint until paint was gone or too many people started asking questions about what we were doing. So this one was totally different. There were movie cameras and a drone and um, 
students and my kids were there, you know, just went on and on and on. Um, we had matching t-shirts with the compliment of the house. Um, and so it was great, people felt great, they'd gone to the hood, they'd helped do something, right? And then it was really important that the secondary part of the component of the project be realized as well, which is that the house came down within two weeks of it being painted. And so then it opens up a whole other conversation about this idea of being a good Samaritan, or what does, what's the objective of social engagement, or how do you achieve um, positive change? Um, what's, the, what's the possibility when you're still, at the end of the day, talking about a very, um, a very typical system of erasure and removal of uh, whole portions of the city. And so we began to, to uh, start having these convenings on these lots after the houses were torn down, but also started to notice that they'd let me take anything from the houses they were demolishing it except for the brick. So they would fence in the area and then they would salvage the brick for a week or two after the houses were built. And that's because the, how, the foundation of many of these houses um, is Chicago common brick, which was made after the Chicago fire and is highly resilient, but is no longer manufactured because it's an uh, extremely toxic process. Um, and so now what happens um, when you start to really think about the, the foundation of these places as another kind of portion of the story? And so we also think about value and whose systems of value or authority um, are relevant and in what moments. So to me, in a lot of ways, this is almost like Albers and this idea of relational. So on the left is a quote from Eric Bennett, who used to live on the block where this house was. So I was actually waiting to take this picture, waiting for the sun to go down. It says the right moment. Um, and he drives up and he says, did you do that? And so I'm always really nervous because, I, again, I haven't gotten any permission, right? And I said, yes. He says, oh, I thought Prince was coming. <laughs> and so he talked to me for a long time about how this, this house sat there invisible, right, for a decade, boarded up, and when the purple came, he just knew it was a secret symbol that their neighborhood was worthy, right, of, of, of this kind of giant coming and, and doing these impromptu concerts for the community that had been kind of um, decimated by the, the railroad coming in and buying up all the land for a development project that they had. And so even after 45 minutes of talking and even after me showing him pictures of us painting and when he left, he said, he still could come. So it was, it was really beautiful to have that to be a sort of success of the project, right? Like unsolicited, that moment happened, and, and that was a kind of affirmation or one story of how things worked. The other was Patrick Schumacher, who is a prominent architect and um, has now taken over Zaha Hadid's um, firm, who had a serious problem with my project in particular and thought it had no place in architecture by any or any conversation about art and went on and on and on on Twitter, which I don't have, so I didn't know this. So my friends called to say I was famous because Patrick Schumacher said that my project was horrible. So we happened to meet. So this is a perfect picture. We actually were having a really good conversation, but I love the face because he's like stuttering. When he met me in that moment and realized who I was, it was a lot of like backtracking and explaining. And I was like, no, you, you totally have a right to your opinion. And then once you realize that that is irrelevant to the people that I'm invested in, then you can make that decision, right? But we have this really good dialogue about uh, social housing and architecture and where investment should happen and all these kinds of things. But really just this idea of whose opinion counts when and why. So there's the purple house coming down. And then this idea of value related to memory. So the project lived on in a project uh, curated by Allison Glenn, who's now down in um, New Orleans working on Prospect. Um, which is a big art exhibition, but she curated a dozen artists to put images on billboards throughout the city and then created this project called Messages in the Street where you had this map where you can meander from as far north as Logan Square down to 63rd and Greenwood. And so for me, I thought it was an interesting kind of afterlife of that project to place it in a different, slightly different neighborhood but the same kind of context and then to have these impromptu discussions about what it means for a, a billboard that would typically have a Crown Royal ad to be replaced by this, this conceptual project about it, and how would people respond to these really weird art billboards <laughs> all over the city. Um, and so then we use the event to also use typical kind of architectural marking 
elements, so these are utility markers, that then we, we handed out to residents and neighborhood folks and passersby and art friends um, that came to help have this conversation and to really talk about what's the value of what lies beneath. So again, this idea of, of the material memory or this idea of vacancy not being as empty as we think it is. And so mentioning that the, these bricks are valuable and starting to think about ways to use art and art installations to bring that message to the neighborhood. I started thinking about uh, gold, painting gold or gold leafing, these pallets of bricks that get salvaged. So a typical pallet is about 540 bricks and that generally equals a ton with Chicago brick. And so what does it mean if we were able to calculate the value, the literal value of this land and then also make it visible for people? So there we are with my daughters digging up bricks at the side of the purple house bringing them back to the studio, and then starting the process of really making them feel like gold. So we painted and spray painted, and gold leafing ended up being the, the method that was most useful, or uh, that, that gave the, the proper resonance. It's a painful task, but they look absolutely beautiful. Um, and it's, it's really interesting how many people are um, taking with, again, such a simple process, right? So anybody could go get some gold leaf and some bricks, but there's something about um, seeing it in this context that really just resonates with people and kind of makes the, makes the conversation very visible for them. And so lately I've been thinking about the relationship to ideas about the Yellow Brick Road and The Wiz, which is the African-American version of The Wizard of Oz, the first movie I saw in 1979. And it's Michael Jackson and Diana Ross, um, I think in a junkyard or a salvage yard, and they find these bricks, these yellow bricks amongst the, the rubble, and then it leads to the, the yellow brick road. And so this summer, hopefully, we'll, we'll do a public art installation as part of Year of Public Art to embed some of my gold bricks into some um, desire paths in some of these vacant lots, those kind of shortcut paths that get worn by people cutting through. Um, and then really becoming obsessed with brick and thinking about ways to just explore and test out in real time as I'm making this other work. So partnered with uh, Trisha Van Eck and 6018 North, which is her experimental space up in um, uptown in Edgewater neighborhood in Chicago, um, and Three Arts, which is a, an organization that supports artists, and I'm a former awardee. As part of Art Expo last year, we literally just built a wall and deconstructed the wall. So what, what does it actually take to make a wall and take it down? So obviously last September, a lot of talk was about wall, and really just thinking about how how much labor and how much um, communal activity can actually go into that process. And to, again, just bring up questions about the, the larger narrative that was, that was floating around related to ideas of uh, walls as barriers or the potential of walls as bridges. So again, to my shock and surprise, it was a huge success and people were very um, interested in learning how to, what's called butter brick is when you put the mortar on. This is my daughter's not doing anything safe, but they're making the wall. And there's my husband in the back being the boss again. He started directing <laughs> shortly thereafter arriving. Um, and then taking the wall right back down um, and thinking about just the, the process again of, of how we value what, what kind of moments of labor. Um, Pixel is a project in St. Louis. So Andres Hernandez and I went to architecture school together actually and um, have been friends for 20 years but have never actually worked directly with one another. So he's taken a path to arts education um, and is really rooted in, in being an educator. So he's uh, on the faculty at, at SAIC in Chicago in their arts education department. And so we've jumped in with the Pulitzer and Wash U to really contemplate these same sorts of issues of vacancy and material value, but in St. Louis, which has a, a different sort of issue and problem with bricks um, as a material and with vacancy. So asking as our prompts the idea of what happens when we unbuild or think about uh, these moments at the end of their, their cycle. And so this is just a typical driving down a street in St. Louis and like a, a house that's vacated but is you know, standing up by a thread. And so the, it exists a lot as a landscape. And so we thought about other artists who've done um, site-specific installations that talk about the idea of um, vacancy, voids, infill, um, scale, helping people reimagine the space or an understanding of space, fellow Cornellian Gordon Mata Clark, also to help us contextualize the kinds of things that we've been thinking about. So this is Gordon Mata Clark on purpose, and this is St. Louis not on purpose, right? So it sits like this all over the city and sort of really amazing to 
to come upon these things over and over again. So the, the, the ghost, the what's not there, as a way to reimagine how we, how we could make a there. So this is the Pulitzer, and this is our vacant parcel. This is the former project that was there. It's a, it's a two-year temporary installation that exists um, along this kind of arts corridor. So we've created an, a kind of extended project that will, that will slow down the demolition process and mark these moments. And I should go back and say, so, so a few months into the project, we found out that this building had to come down because of some structural issues. Um, so it was fully occupied as the Bruno David Gallery and was holding exhibitions and then had to be vacated unexpectedly. And so we took that as an opportunity to talk about this range of experiences and emotions that, that people go through, whether it's a natural disaster or an unexpected demolition or foreclosure. Like there's still a kind of process that we collectively are experiencing that we're missing out an opportunity to use as a unifier. So these moments become a way in which we highlight different kind of components of that process and use it to have uh, different varying conversations with various communities. So the marking was the painting of the building, the subtracting will be the removal of the building, the translating will be the transition of that material, and then finally uh, shaping and healing will be about redistributing that material to the larger St. Louis community. So to go from a full volume to some sort of revised understanding to uh, at an even smaller scale, a kind of like spreading of, of the ashes or um, planting of the seeds. So we have a website, because why not have a website, called awayaway.site, but the project's called Away Away Listen While I Say, and references a, an old blues standard. <laughs> uh, so marking, we painted the building gold, and we actually invited people that had relationships with the building, and then in a week, they're gonna start demolition, which we've choreographed, and then we're gonna start stacking the bricks as the pallet that I talked about before on this pad, and then we're gonna engage various members of the St. Louis community to take each pallet and reimagine or refashion the bricks. So it's all very poetic, and I hope it all comes off without a hitch. We, we're mid-project, so um, I'll come back and tell you how it, how it went. We had a programming event a few weeks ago where similar to the kind of marking with the that's telling me to stop talking to marking, that we asked passers-by what they thought about this building just sort of popping up being gold and what, what could or should happen to the materials. Then the last project I'm gonna show you guys is a cut map series that I'd actually started before Color Theory, but that will be a prominent component of my show at the MCA, in which again, I thought about collapsing um, spaces, either psychic spaces or physical spaces, and the idea that a neighborhood like Inglewood, which is where many of those houses were painted, um, is Paris to a lot of the people that live there. Like if Paris is an idealized sort of landscape or space that one might never come in contact with uh, if, if they're from Inglewood or have, has never left the United States, what does it mean to put those two types of spaces, idealized and then sort of routinely vilified in proximity to one another? And then what does it mean to, when you're not thinking of America as the locus of everything, what does it mean to really understand the tensions that actually exist in Paris that don't make it idealized? And the fact that the suburbs are actually now the kind of poster child for, for the bad, right? That, that's where the, that's where the um, terrorists are from, that's where the immigrants live, and that there's no correlation between those kinds of associations being made about who gets to occupy the idealized Paris. And so the, the inverse of that original map is then that that Paris is the block that's impenetrable and that Inglewood is actually much closer to the banyus than it is to Paris itself in terms of a, a kind of understanding of the spatial readings. And so the latest series that um, sort of parallels this or is the, is the offshoot of, of this work is um, a series that I'm gonna do that will pair together places that have been associated with the term Chirac um, which was a colloquial term sort of originated by rappers in relationship to some of the South Side neighborhoods, but that gets a lot of pushback as being a negative moniker or an inaccurate moniker for any um, of, of us who've experienced war, um, either firsthand as residents or as veterans. Um, and so it's a hotly contested conversation that doesn't necessarily have a right and a wrong, but people on both sides that feel very strongly about their belief in it. And so instead of declaring a Chirac, really just putting again in proximity the neighborhoods that might be thought of as Chirac in Chicago with an actual map of Iraq. Um, and really, really getting people to confront 
a landscape that they probably have never even seen or could point out on a map and to really think about what it means to make those kinds of correlations. So with that, I'll do my, I've been threatened about not doing social media, so you can keep up with my progress on uh, Instagram mostly, and then also visit me on my site, um, as well as to if you wanna email me or, or ask me questions. But with that, I will open it up to questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, a great question. So I think the kind of invisible force in that is actually like the building code, right? Or these, these ways in which we as designers or visual thinkers always kind of like shun or cringe at like, you know, um, governments and agencies and, and these actual systems in place that form that, right? And so if you think of somewhere like Barcelona that has a pretty progressive, um, vision about planning, then it leads to really strong understandings, not only of the history of those materials, but then also very forward thinking ways about how we operate. So you often see, especially in architecture, a lot of things that you can get away with in, in Europe in particular, you can't do here, right? Because we have all these regulations that some of them are warranted, but a lot of them are just not innovative in the way they think about keeping us safe. You know, a building has to stand up and do certain things, but then also allowing a kind of innovation. So how can you write into a code that level of innovation? Um, and then, you know, as an extension of that to your question, how do you write that into, like, lead certification? How do you write that into historic preservation? It's been interesting because the preservation community has really been on me to come and talk with them. And I was like, preservation? This isn't preservation. But just other ways to think about time. Like, is every building supposed to last forever? Um, I would, like you, argue that we don't value enough of the ones that, that we have. We're much younger than most parts of the world, so we also are existing now in a moment where we can throw things away a lot easier than you could with piazzas or with, I mean, maybe that's not exactly true, right? But like there's a, there's a value system that's embedded in that, but then there's also a way that things had to work that we can bypass. And so how do we actively resist the bypassing, but really smartly, right? So we have to understand the systems in order to help to alleviate that. So, I mean, it's somebody's got to do it, but that means somebody has to be in the building code department who's like really cool and innovative, right? Like everybody wants to go be Zaha Hadid, right? But who's who's in the building department, right? So that's the that's the part where we have to also kind of bake into our our education and our process, I think. Other questions? Um, so you said your husband's an athlete. Yes. What, what sport does he play? He played football, and he's also a fan of College of DuPage. We have been here many times. Uh, but it was, it's more about, like, achieving a – he played briefly in the NFL, and it's, like, more about achieving a very big goal. He's a running back, so he's a little tiny. You saw him. He's tiny. So doing something nobody would expected you to have done. And so that's where, we, that's where he was able to lock into the project, and it was actually really helpful at being, like, an outside eye that could ask the really basic questions. You know, we get very marred sometimes in our – idea and the meaning and the theory and the discourse and how does it situate itself and, and you know he's like where's the green one you know like we're painting and he's I'm like it's not a rainbow and he's like well it is right so like really really clear readings of things that help you kind of re reimagine it so it's been great to have him as part of the process what was your best experience this? oh my goodness it's still going it's like it's like eating cake for every meal, I tell somebody. It's just like overwhelming. Um, the, the best experience, like personally, is that I'm very um, anal and organized, and things have to work a certain way, and have to plan it all out, and have to know what's going to happen. And so this project was really a breakthrough personally for this idea of like, you can make your best work when you have no idea what the answer is. And I still don't have the answer. Right? I started all of this to understand painting better. And even though these are a kind of painting, I'm still obsessing about a two-dimensional canvas with, you know, oil pigment. Um, so for me, that's been the best kind of lesson that I'm still kind of right in the middle of. And then experiences, I would say, definitely top is the is Eric 
talking about Prince, and actually developing relationships. Um, and in terms of the question of community, even though I knew community was not monolithic, really seeing how the houses almost had a personality, not just through color, but through where they were, even though they were in sort of similar um, physical context, the, I painted two yellow houses and that block was split down the middle. Half the block hates me, half the block loves me, right? So that there's a full range of like, it's not all Pollyanna and it's so wonderful, um, but that it allows all of those ranges of conversation. So I befriended the people that lived on the, on the purple block. Um, and so that's a really great, right? If you had to, people are asking about like a litmus or what are your metrics, nobody's asked that, but right, if you start saying metrics of a project, then that's the, those are the moments where you're like, there would have been no other way to get this kind of community engagement, right? That's so serendipitous and so, but you can draw these lessons from. So I think that's been, and it's still going, so I feel like I need 10 years to like, you know, absorb it all. I'm curious, um, in the process when we were getting a lot of attention for color theory, um, through that and through the architecture writing, you started to get uh, attention from individuals, say the mayor or other people who would who'd want to associate themselves yes. with the positive side of your project, but conversely were directly responsible, responsible for many of yes. the issues you were <laughs> And I'm just curious as you know, an artist or an architect, how you balance that, because they could serve your cause, but at the same time, someone using what you've hit on to lighten their yes. public persona while they were responsible and, and continue to be responsible for a lot of the issues. Yeah, so that was a, the, the mayor in particular, that was like a, not quite a crisis moment, right? But it was sort of a moment where, um, on the one hand, you're, you're instantly worried or concerned with exploitation, but then also like your credibility. And on the other hand, you have this person who's super enthusiastic who's like, what do you want to do? So like all of a sudden, all you're griping about the disparities and the problems and the so-and-so, like let's meet, what do you want to do? We can make it happen. Um, and so what it's meant is me, kind of back to that question about um, the recycling of architecture, it's meant me trying to understand the value of being able to sit at the table. And so now, because of that relationship, I sit at a lot of tables. And it's not direct, right? It's more for as many people that were like, oh, I can't believe you're talking to him. There were 20 other people that all of a sudden decided it meant I should be on something. So not through the behest of him, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, she needs to be on this council about so-and-so. Well, Amanda is the one that knows about how to engage community properly. Well, right, and all of it, even though I'm saying, that's not true, excuse me, I don't know how to do that. And then at some moment you're like, oh, but I'm here to offer that voice. And so it's a moment to offer that voice. And if the instance comes where it's like, what would you do? I'm ready, right, without realizing it. So um, I've continued to be able to straddle that line a little bit partly from this idea that just off of one project, the idea that I can use art to, to instigate conversations of change. So that also becomes a really good mandate for, for my practice going forward. Like, how many ways can you start to continue to do this? Um, but it's led to everything from learning about portions of the um, administration that I didn't even know existed to being able to make a call for things and actually getting a response. So um, with color theory, it was initially illegal, but then there was a, um, an initiative to bring in youth to it. So I got to work with the building department, the streets and sanitation, the legal department, like six or seven different departments that normally would never work together to come together and make this project work. And then they were so pleased with themselves, you know, they're like, oh, what are we going to do next year? It's like, next year? Oh, my God. Right? So, and then being able to bring in the art friends. I think that's been another really good component of it. And then to have people have to question in real time for themselves, right? Like, if you think this person is the villain or you think this administration is the villain or you have a, rightly so, this argument about schools closing and you're an arts educator, I'm handing you this mural project. So you have to grapple with yourself about whether that compromises your values or whether you think that's, that you can use that. And so it's been a great in real time to, to kind of drag everybody else along and say, Hey, here it here it is. Do you want it? And then we can we can debate about the merits, you know, per project or in general or the philosophies. But um, it's it's definitely led to being 
being at tables that I didn't think cared about art or at least willing to listen even if they don't necessarily care because of because of the exposure so I'm still grappling with that too but I'm less nervous now because you realize you do have you do have the street cred like when I realize that I do have 20 years of integrity right then people don't question they know my heart right so they assume I'm making an effort in the right direction so that's been rewarding as well.